You see, I've never shared this before, first with you. But this is real, the journey that we went through. This tech founder spent four years working for Elon Musk at Tesla, but after taking a two-month break, he realized he wasn't done reshaping the automotive industry as we know it. Today, I'm speaking with Jay Vijayan, founder and CEO of Techion, a multi-billion dollar tech company that's building a new type of automotive retailing platform for dealers. We discuss raising millions of dollars to reimagine dealership technology, lessons from working for Elon Musk, why he bought two physical car dealerships even though he's a tech company, leading without an exit plan, and much more. Don't forget to click subscribe so you never miss an episode. What's up, everyone? This is Car Dealership Guy. You're listening to the Car Dealership Guy podcast, which is my effort to give you access to the most unbiased and transparent insights into the car market. But before we get into the show, people ask me all the time, CDG, can you help me fill an open role in my company? Well, now I can. I'm excited to announce my new industry job board. I built this job board so that employers in the auto industry can take advantage of my network and distribution. Your company needs roles filled and I have access to talent. It's a win-win situation. This job board is for anyone in automotive, vendors, dealers, lenders, manufacturers, auto tech, you get the point. The best part is that posting roles is 100% free. Over 50 companies have already posted open roles, including Lithia Motors, Recurrent, Credit Acceptance, Cars Commerce, Shift Digital, and over 20 dealer groups. Add your open roles today by visiting my website at dealershipguide.com and clicking on industry job board or visit the link in the show notes below. This episode is also brought to you by Valvoline. You might know Valvoline is the original motor oil. After all, they've been at it since 1866. But to their dealership customers, there's so much more. When you partner with Valvoline, your dealership not only gets access to legendary Valvoline products, but also to their customer business solutions, marketing resources, consumer promotions, and other programs that go beyond the traditional supplier partnership. Valvoline can help you drive your service department by streamlining operations and increasing revenue with hands-on technician and sales advisor training, state-of-the-art service lane technology, and a robust preventative maintenance chemical program. They even have programs to help you sell more cars and increase trade-ins. What other fixed ops vendor can say that? So what's all this mean for you? Fewer vendors, more value, and a brand your customers know and trust. Valvoline's reinventing how supplier partners with the dealership. For more information about how Valvoline can become your ultimate fixed ops partner, visit partner.valvoline.com or click the link in the show notes below. You were at Tesla and some of the some of the heated years. I think lots of us have read the Elon Musk uh, di- um, uh, biography. And just tell us a little bit about your your rise in the tech industry, your time at Tesla, what you learned there. Go. I mean, there's a lot of questions I could ask, but let's just start there. I started as a software engineer. You see, you know, that's that's my background, how I kind of grew up in career. Software engineer, product development. I was in a large, you know, one of the largest enterprise software company, Oracle, for almost eight years, building ERP product. I felt that at that time itself, like, you know, SaaS and cloud are the future, and someday I'm going to start a SaaS company. I felt some of the large companies... Uh, including Oracle, are a little bit slower, of course, naturally because of the large, large, the nature of how big they are in embracing cloud and moving. I felt there is a huge opportunity there. So that's kind of the seed of the idea, and then moved on to VMware, which was you, which you probably know the server virtualization space. Phenomenal company. I joined right around their IPO. Stayed there for almost five years. Hyper growth. Learned a lot, and then my entry into automotive first time was at Tesla. Um, I did interview with Tesla in 2010 before their IPO. Long story short, um, I was very interested, very intrigued, interest, you know, very intrigued about Elon's vision on what he wants to do. You know, at that time, it's different. You, you can't imagine Tesla of today. This is 2010. It's like it's a far-fetched, you know, dream. But I was quite, quite interested and intrigued. Uh, but the deal didn't work out. For me, it was not attractive enough for me to lose. So I, in fact, declined um, the offer from Tesla and I stayed at VMware. Then after a year, I was approached again uh, in uh, you know December 2011. And meanwhile, I was following the company and they launched the Model S concept. And I loved the way the car looked and everything they've been doing. And you know, then I met Elon again in 2011, December. And he convinced me this time to, you know, jump in and where they are going. And I ended up as a tech guy to, his vision was to build an entire platform for a brand new automotive, you know, brand like Tesla. So that was an exciting opportunity for someone who's a product and engineering 
um, you know, background to build something for a new automotive company. So I ended up joining Tesla. I still took a pay cut from a cash perspective, uh, but I got more stocks, which I negotiated, which worked out okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that... To and say the least. Up, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, he has uh, built, you know, incredible value. And I was heads down uh, building the platform end to end, starting from, you know, uh, which is today Tesla.com to internal systems, ERP, you know, some of the factory systems and then the store systems. Honestly, I, I didn't come from the automotive industry, so I had a very fresh perspective. So I had this opportunity to evaluate what is happening in the automotive industry. So I was able to, you know, look at what's happening because as a co consumer, I remembered multiple car buying experiences. I bought Toyota, I bought BMW for myself in the Bay Area. It was, uh, least to say, a very horrible experience. You know, I was a very well-informed guy. I go by data. I did my research to buy a BMW. I knew exactly what car to buy. I was willing to pay, but I still spent almost, you know, seven hours in a dealership with my wife. Horrible, grueling experience. Um, it's not that people, you know, intentionally were doing that, but the point was why in this day and age um, we should spend this much time. This was before Tesla. And then now... I felt like, wow, I mean, there's, a, there's an opportunity to transform, at least for one brand, I could transform this experience. So now I studied everything, then realized how fragmented, which was a good thing for me. I didn't come with preconceived notion. For me, everything was a fresh perspective. But I was so surprised to see how much fragmentation existed. People were good. Their intentions were good in the industry. They wanted to serve customers. They wanted to provide best experience. And to be honest with you, they were dealing with very antiquated platform, very broken system. You know this well, you know, you're running, you run a dealership. To do a deal in the new car side, it's even more extreme. People have to open 10 different windows to do a deal. Whether you like it or not, you can figure out based on your level of expertise, you may be able to conceal or patch up, not revealing that to the customer, but the customer really sees it, right? Customers see that you're doing something that they don't trust because you have to do so many things to go through a deal. So for me, it was very obvious. The problems were very, very obvious. So we were able to go list out everything and say, how are we going to solve every one of these problems so that the experience for Tesla is seamless, that Tesla consumers is seamless. I think we did that. You're a Tesla at this point. How do you come up with the idea for Techion? What happens and why is it? Is it simply you say, I've built this you know, phenomenal software here. I want to go bring it to the rest of the world, right? What was that driver for you? Great question. So two things connected, okay? So going back to my, I mentioned to you my Oracle days that, you know, cloud and SaaS is the future and every business eventually have to move to the cloud and there's a lot of power in making it easy for businesses and consumers. Connecting to my dot, when I did my research on how big the problems of the automotive industry, of course, I, I had an opportunity and thanks to Tesla, thanks to Elon for giving me that opportunity. Uh, we were able to solve that for Tesla customers. Then I felt, okay, this industry is massive. You know, at that time, you know, Tesla is still growing up and it was a fraction of the industry. And I felt, wow, 99% of the industry is struggling without any kind of, you know, technology, uh, modern technology platform. So that's the idea. So connecting two things. One, I felt automotive industry clearly jumped out to be served for my SaaS idea, you know, SaaS vertical. And I felt connecting the dots, I felt, okay, this is the vertical. This is the industry. I want to create a SaaS platform. There is incredible amount of value that we could deliver to the industry that's been underserved for decades. And honestly, this was never many things in your life are as crystal clear as this. For me, it was very clear. Okay, this, this is the industry I want to, you know, create and solve problems and create a business out of it. And, you know, while people kept warning about the barriers in the industry, one after the other, right? Big, you you may know this well. People warned me about how complex it is to build a DMS, let alone a DMS, 
versus building an end-to-end platform for automotive dealerships and entire automotive retail. Second is integrations was a massive barrier. People said, no, no, no. Some of the big mammoth software companies have tried and given up. And there were examples. To create a, a dealership management system. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, some of the biggest software companies have tried in the past and gave up. Incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. One of the things people brought up is getting integrations done in the industry. There are like hundreds of integrations you need to be, you need to be completing before you can serve a dealership. The biggest ones are getting the manufacturer integrations. So every brand manufacturer, you need to get integration completed for you to roll out their brand dealership. So what what does that mean? If you want to br- truly bring a transformation to run a big dealer group or small, whatever it is, right? You, especially if you're doing a big group who runs like 35 brands, which we have now today as our customers, you have to have all the 35 brands integrated. Every integration points need to be completed and done. This incumbents had decades to do. We didn't. We did the whole thing in two, two and a half years. Every single brand. We're integrated with 42 brands today. That's unbelievable. Tell us about, give us some insight to working with Elon. What was that like? What did you learn from Elon? I see the smile on your face already. <laughs> oh, no, a lot, lot, lot. To be honest with you, I was fortunate to work for him directly. So I had an opportunity to work with him. Um, there's so much I learned, right? So he extremely intense on solving consumer problems. Really no compromise. He doesn't take no for an answer, which now the whole world knows. But I think it is a lot of learning. I would say I'm thrilled eventually within like a six to six months to a year after I built trust with him. One of very few organizations in the company, um, I think he will agree to it. Well, maybe he's very ha- he was very hands off. He was very hands off. He would, of course, he would ask deep questions, but I think that showed that, you know, I gained his confidence that we can deliver to, you know, his expectations, which are, you know, least to say super high, right? So I think it was, it was great. What did I learn? Extreme amount of customer obsession, taking no for an answer in solving consumer problems. In the sense, one important one I'd say is he would question, which I did, even even preempting every click to say, does the consumer need to even have this click at this level? He would question every single click to remove friction in consumer journey. So there's so much, you know, learning. And then um, the other one from a business side, solving business problems, he would go, I mean, which the whole world knows, right? Of course, there are books on it now. Um, Always question the fundamentals, right? Um, You'll say, okay, when someone starts as like, okay, we can't solve this problem, he will keep drilling down until he gets to the bottom, the fundamentals of, and then push whoever that is to start thinking from ground up saying that, okay, yeah, this, you can't solve this problem if you just, you know, think only superficial solution, go back and fundamentally redo it, whatever it takes, even if you have to rebuild the whole thing, he will push to do it. You know, honestly, not every time he's right, but he's right enough number of times to make things super successful. It's well said. Tell, tell us about your first deal at Techian, right? You mentioned something that's astonishing, which is it took you. So you've at this point, I'm kind of fast forwarding on your journey here, right? You've left Tesla, you've ideated Techian, and you know here you are. You've built. Well, you want to tell us? So you built an MVP, and I don't want to. You know, I don't want to steer your thunder here, right? You've, no, no, no. I'll, I'll share. Built- it's a, it's a, it's an important story. I'll share a short version. So please t- tell us about that story because I want to understand the beginnings. I want and the beginnings and that first that first deal that you scored. Let me let me start. It might be long, but feel free to interrupt. Right, I want. I think it'll be good for you to get the perspective. When I decided to leave Tesla and you know started my own company, um, people thought I I was crazy. Even people in my team thought because I was one of the very few executives who established very strong trust. Elon, I was able to build everything that the company needed almost. I say I wouldn't say everything, but yes, we really brought that vision to life. And people thought I was, I was crazy. Like, why would you leave? Um, in fact, uh, there was uh, one of my direct reports in my one-on-one after announcing I was leaving, thought I'm going to work for some secret project for president at that time, president of the United States. 
And he said, that, Jay, that's why you're not telling why, where you're, why you're leaving and where you're going. I said, no, 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 I am going to take a break, which I did. I did take, you know, a few months break, which I used to do a lot more analysis. I met a lot of dealers. I met a lot of OEM executives. I did tons of research before really jumping. And then I jumped in, started the company, started with my personal money. And we started at our, you know, at my garage. Uh, we had a few people, um, and, you know, four people including myself and then um shifted to my home office um and then eventually we found an office after several months and then the the thing is we had a we had a very clear vision uh, you see you know not to your scale but we were in stealth mode for almost you know three and a half years we didn't reveal what we are doing not many people knew about us um, we were heads down focused on developing the product and then the idea was few things we took you know few steps to get to an end-to-end platform because people clearly said building an end-to-end platform, a TMS, CRM, whatever you call it as, you know, people call specific product names because the core product left a lot of gaps that was filled by many, many, many other products out of need, which is okay. It's all good. There are some great companies doing some great things, but the customer workflow needs to be understood cleanly and we ended up developing. The first product we launched, we called it as digital service experience, only for service module, service for dealerships. Okay. Mm. So that, that was your wedge. You started only with first, service. Wedge, exactly. 2018. But here's the deal. It it was, you know, funny learning, funny in the sense it was hard, but in the sense I learned the problem, right? So even for service, what happened was it became a massive chicken and egg problem. Okay. So we created a prototype. We showed it to dealers, um, you know, through my question. Every dealer who saw was quite excited. They were like, wow, this is cool, man. This is like, you know, I would I would definitely use something like this. But now they said, unfortunately, my manufacturer needs to go certify this product. And then, okay, I go to um, manufacturers and, you know, of course, because a little bit about my Tesla you know, CIO, people were at least able to give me time for a meeting. But manufacturers were very honest, very clear. They were like, okay, you know, unfortunately, we are so busy. We have so many things to prioritize. Until you have 50 or 100 dealerships, 100 would be a good number. Unfortunately, we can't start any kind of integration work. So you could see the chicken and egg. So a dealer says, I love it. I can't roll out before my manufacturer certifies. If you go to a manufacturer, they say, I can't talk to you until you have 100 dealerships. And then, we, yeah, there's one more caveat, you know, curveball, where, oh, you need to integrate with the existing DMSs. We were okay with that, to be honest with you. But I'll be very honest, the existing DMSs, when you go to integrate with them, they give you a contract that says almost you, you know, write off your firstborn child to them, where basically you could never compete with them ever in the future. So we decided, no, we are not going to sign that because we know there is a vision we are working towards. We are totally open and integrating. We have an API. Again, you see, I've never shared this before, first with you. But this is real, real, the journey that we went through. We had to, you know, solve this problem. You know, end of the day, we are committed. How do we come across all of these things? So we had to do a lot of, you know, one compelling, compelling, because end of the day, incremental is not enough. You know this industry. You can't show just incremental to break through these barriers. Whatever we do has to be super compelling for them to say, you know what, I'm going to make an exception for this. So that's kind of how we started. We went really full force, you know, building some of the best solutions in the product, got the dealers excited, have the dealers start calling their manufacturers, get the manufacturing um, executives who are in charge of you know, dealer networks, get them excited showing, no, 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 this is not something we are going to just solve for a dealer. This is a big value for your brand consumers. This is going to solve the consumer problem and the dealer problem. So now then they started opening doors. So it took a lot of effort, everything from innovation, perseverance, knocking doors, you know, breaking barriers. Eventually. Who was that first? Who was that first that gave you the opportunity? Uh, General Motors was the first who gave the opportunity and then followed by at that time uh you know um fca uh, which is fiat chrysler 
that time now it's Atlantis, uh, and then many others, you know, followed. Like you said, the first was General Motors, definitely thanks to them, and they saw the vision end to end. And it didn't happen overnight. They followed us for almost two years before making any kind of decision to. They will check in every six months, like what are we doing? Okay, how are you doing? How many, or, you know, how many dealers? Then we also started building confidence with General Motors um, dealer network, which also had other brands. So slowly that network effect started expanding, expanding, and we focused heavily on you know building and showing value. And that's something I'm proud to say. You would talk to our dealers. One thing they will always get excited. In fact, one of our dealers recently said, Jay, every month when Techion, uh, you know, does its release, it's like Christmas for us. We've never seen, <laughs> you know, features asking and waiting the new for features. years. Yeah. Yes, new features, all the cool things. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been a fun journey. Uh, yes. It's an incredible story. I mean, who, who was the first dealer? I didn't ask you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, there's a dealer in California called us um, California Automotive Retailing Group. I think they have 20 plus dealerships now. So that was the first dealer. And then there's immediate. So we did three pilots, California Automotive Retailing Group. And then the East Coast, we have Ingersoll Auto in Connecticut. And then we have one in Florida. It's a Chevrolet dealership. I think the dealer principal's name is Charles Winton. So there are three dealers. We Again, we consciously did three pilots of the full end-to-end -end platform. California, East Coast, and South, right, in Florida. That way, truly the platform works for, you know, different county, state, district, tax calculation, operations, and everything. Now, at this point, were you were you still only service when you started expanding, or were you already a full we DMS? We launched service in um, October 2018. 2019, July, we started doing pilots for the three stores um, with full end-to-end -end platform. So that was always in parallel that was going on, but we launched with all the challenges that was going on, we felt it's not worth it to even investing in this because barriers were continuing to be continuing to be bigger. We said, you know what, if you're going to put this much effort, why not put it on the entire solution? So we went all in, literally all in and say, we are going to go develop this. I mean, it's a, it's a long, so there are a lot of people advised, we are taking too much to buy, it. it's too complex. Too, too many things can go wrong, especially in building an accounting module and, you know, all of these things. For me, the decision was very clear. We we will not be another, you know, thousand and one of thousand point solutions that exist. If we are going to solve this problem, we're going to solve this comprehensively for our dealers and for the automotive retail industry. So we went all in. It was a highly risky proposition, to be honest with you. We could have run out of money at that time itself. Uh, because we took massive undertaking to build a DMS and then we got it done. We got it done and we continued to scale from that time onwards. 2020 onwards, it was just a full launch GA and kept rolling out dealers. And one of the dealer groups, I would say, mm, I want to definitely call out, I always, you know, respect for their brand name but these has been incredible partners first enterprise group of 30 plus dealership that signed in 2020 was bergstrom automotive in wisconsin you know honestly the best operators i've ever met um one of the very few um you know high integrity phenomenal dealers mr john bergstrom and his son tim bergstrom today they bought more dealerships i think almost up to 39 i'm not be accurate in the exact number. Everything runs on Techion. Every single dealership runs on Wow. Why do you think they gave you that first shot? What do you think got them over the edge? Well, I few things. So one is um, they attended my one of my half a day presentation on a product demo. They truly got excited because they've been in this industry for, I think, 40 years. They've seen everything. I think, like I said, all the things that we did, I mentioned to you, putting in innovation and delivering a product that is compelling with value. They saw that clearly. And they did a lot of diligence, spent time with us, everything, including, you know, data, of course, as you know, dealers are worried who owns the data. We said like plain and simple, there is no gray area, there is no black and white dealers, you own the data. We make our agreements the simplest. In fact, Techian's agreements is the simplest compared to even SaaS, of course, more simpler than any other DMS agreements here. 
we keep it very simple. Dealers own the data. We license the data as your tech platform to run your operations. So they allowed every part of it. And then second, of course, they've been very tired of the incumbent players. Um, they've been doing that for a long time. And then finally, really leapfrog the technology. They're very innovative from thinking perspective, progressive dealers, how the industry is moving. They want to be in the forefront to deliver the best consumer experience, provide the best for their staff, and that way they can serve their consumers um, you know, across Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. T- tell me about what was the most shocking thing that you learned as you were building this and you know you became a fully comprehensive dealership management system again very very big undertaking i mean you you mentioned building out an accounting suite i can't even think about the first step to building out an accounting suite um what was the the most shocking thing you uncovered about the current way dealerships were operating their dealership management systems and a shocking thing is you know it might be obvious for you but when you drill down the amount of fragmentation that exists in the dealership industry really dragging their business backward and honestly they've been relatively they knew they're aware and they want to move but there are many dealers i feel kind of got desensitized to it what do you mean explain that yeah yeah I'll, i'll explain to you right they're okay in because they put 20 band-aids because their staff have learned how to punch in, you know, 150 key codes and open 10 windows and still do a deal, they feel, you know what, I think it's fine. It's painful. At least it works. The second reason is they've had a horrible experience in their past, some time in the past, migrating DMS. So, you know what, taking on this is so painful I would better just live with what I have, even though it's painful. Some of them, not all of the dealers have come to terms. There are many dealers who feel like, you know what, enough is enough. I need to change because if I don't change, someone is going to bring the change to run over my business. So many dealers embrace change. I think there are many dealers who are really coming to terms. It is not as painful, especially migrating to Tagyan because now we've migrated over 1,000 dealers. It's not as painful. Some of the largest groups now, as you know, we announced um, the partnership with Asbury Automotive. Overall, I feel the value that we deliver from a dealership perspective, why, sorry, you asked like, you know, why they are okay with the fragmentation. That's number one, where they said like, things are going okay, past experience was painful, so I may be able to just live through this. But you know this well, how fast automotive industry, more than anyone you see, you know, you're, you're there, you know, pulling, crunching data and pulling information. Industry, industry is evolve, evolving so fast. So now is the time to change uh, because otherwise people who don't change uh, will have a very difficult time in kind of being relevant for the future. So I think that is the most important aspect why sometimes people think twice on change. But the good news is when you explain to them and show them, they're like, oh my God, wow. Okay, I'll tell you a simple example. So one is booking a deal. Okay, you just close a car deal. You have to open, you know, 12 different windows, talk to five different people, and then you have to jump through hoops to close the deal and think about the customer experience on the other side because they see, they see through it. Because today's world, you know this, we all interact with all of these e-commerce companies which are doing amazing. You can do pretty much everything digital. I'm not saying, I think that's an important factor to understand. I'm not saying the entire car buying will go online. I don't think it'll ever go online. Um, Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. Interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Simple example. So let me ask you a question. It's pretty obvious. You can buy every single Apple product online, correct? Every single Apple product, everything. My Mac, the biggest Mac to phone, iPhone. So, but why is there a crowd in an Apple store? Right, And they open new stores. Apple keeps opening new stores. And the line is a mile long when they launch new products. So what does that say? Consumers still want to touch and feel their products, especially even if it is a few thousand dollars, you know, Mac or a thousand five hundred, two thousand dollars iPhone. Think about a twenty, thirty thousand dollar car. Why wouldn't they want to touch and feel? Why Why wouldn't they want to do a test drive? 
the biggest issue in our you know industry is your experience from online to offline completely changes they don't get the same consistent experience so that's exactly what it is my view i i am fairly confident about this i may be wrong but consumers are not asking give me a full digital online buying experience what are they asking is leave it to me you don't tell me how i should shop isn't that right like that's exactly what i mean happened. i took a i took a 50 million dollar lesson learning that the hard way so i think wow. i think you have, you're on to something here <laughs> right see i strongly believe in that that's exactly why i gave apple example because they connect the dots between online and in store because it's the same product it's the same price things don't change so if you give the same experience and they sell more they upsell cross sell tons accessories you know you buy you know everything headphone all kinds of things so now why can't we do that in the car industry if you connect the online and in store seamlessly consumers get the same experience that's exactly why i feel car buying is never going to go 100% online yes the percentage of online shopping is going to increase but if you connect the dots consumers all they are asking is i'll tell you a simple you know you know my 20 year old daughter how she shops versus how i'm going to shop is going to be different so you need to make sure that consumers are saying leave it to me just give me the same experience doesn't matter where i start where i end i should be able to start online or i should walk into a store do a test drive and go back and complete my you know deal buying from the you know comfort of my home so that is the key i feel technology can bridge that from online to in store or in store to online that is what we are working to solve when you explain that to the dealers you know what you need to bridge that gap you need to make sure your staff when they come to the store operate in a efficient way they don't jump through hoops to solve a consumer problem create trust you're going to sell tons and we have ai and machine learning that will enable you to upsell and cross sell a lot more that is a lot more relevant for the consumer did you believe the same thing when you were at tesla or is this something that's been more recent for you in terms of the you know the shift to online versus in store i believe the same i believe the same from that time to today that's why at tesla we work you know to make sure that the in store experience is good you know i i can't speak for now because i left in 2016 which is almost 8 years now <laughs> now no 8 years uh, but at that time yeah you know give connected experience doesn't matter all the way online offline in car just make sure that you give a complete connected experience you know one of the things that i was thinking through when i was preparing for this episode was the fact that when i i remember first looking into techion and seeing that you don't like you need a server room and i explain the ex, like when you saw that for the first time that dealers right for anyone that's not familiar right dealers have these server rooms right because a dms <laughs> you're shaking your head a I'll dms you a required after if you, it's useful on the first dealership that we transformed you know my team took a picture of their server room and after techie on how it is man you will appreciate that it was what was that what well, yeah tell me what was that like for you the the the, the idea of putting a de- a dealership management system in the cloud was that novel were you the first to do that yes we were the first cloud native platform cloud native dms in the space i think even today i don't think there's anything that exists um, after 8 years since we started no as you say well, what benefits tell us about that like what are the differences why why should people why should people care huge is a big time in fact today's world i would say it's a necessity because of the security you know all of these you know social engineering everything from you know spyware malware ransomware it's just crazy to be honest with you it is a necessity today because i still remember and i think it happens today where there is a big server room if you could rem- imagine of course there are dealers who can afford to have an it team there are dealers who don't and it's a small operations but they have to you know hire a consultant and you know sometimes they do a good job and they have to based on his part time he will do only what he can but the second problem is you literally expose the dealership for massive problems i don't know if you heard and i've heard from many dealers indirectly and directly that they 
under they were under ransomware attack literally their servers got yeah. you know I locked actually posted by... about that yeah um yeah cyber security threats and hacks are they're at i'm not sure if it's all time highs for dealers but it's definitely increased yeah and that doesn't happen on the cloud because the reason is you're leaving it to a chance to one person who does it part time in some cases and old unupdated servers and as you know well in the dealership you can if you all you know have some software outdated you click on a link by mistake it downloads to your you know desktop that is connected to your local server so they just go and hack and lock your local hard disk and your server down you can't you know get out of it until you pay a ransom that doesn't happen because you have professionals you have security tools in fact uh, you see we have the highest level of privacy and security certifications in the industry and i don't think any other tms has this soc 1 soc 2 type 2 certifications we recently got iso 2 iso certifications once for privacy and one for security and i'll be happy to share details and this is factual information you should be able to look up and dealers and we created something called as trust portal you can go to techion.com/trust it just literally shows what we are doing for security and privacy while there are so many other benefits of course overhead of not maintaining a server and being more comfortable sleeping peacefully in the night so that he could don't get you know hacked and there are so many other benefits everything from you know performance um, on the cloud information is not lost if your power is down that's another good example practical example so today at a, even at a techion dealership if the power goes down you can use the mobile phone to check in your customers your service drive doesn't have to stop you can still the service advisors can use the mobile phone 5g to start checking in your customers everything goes directly to the cloud let's dig into that for a second so how are you how are you actually building tech for dealerships and the question what i'm trying to get at here is are you building tech around current processes or are you truly trying to you know look ahead and figure out what is the trend or what's the next you know what's a better way to do the things how are you really going about that both first is we have a very clear you know the bigger picture problem to solve so we have a road map saying like we need to keep pushing the envelope right as i said three big areas of consumer journey okay number one car shopping and buying okay so we will keep pushing the envelope on that like how do you make that better and seamless and seamless i launched one additional product at nada in my keynote speech so you see it be helpful I know you, how busy you are. I'll send you three links. One is my keynote speech; it's around twenty minutes. I launched two new products. One is in this space exactly, the advanced um, retail. Second is generative AI. So this is the second generative AI product we launched, and I also talk about how much we have invested in AI from the beginning, and how we are investing in generative AI now, context specific to generate value for our dealers. So two broader themes, I would say. the first one is the cons- the um, consumer journey so three consumer journeys c- car buying shopping and buying service and maintenance which is vehicle service and maintenance third is consumer engagement engaging right with crm engage with your dealership doesn't matter how you engage you can buy a car you take it for service or you can even buy an accessory still an engagement so you want to make sure you connect the dots on the consumer journey seamlessly you don't need so many hops and things fall through the cracks see you know today's world I've been there before. If you walk into a dealership for the seventh time, and if they ask who you are and your phone number and email, tell me how how upset you're going to be, right? I I will be upset, right? Very upset because today, if you go to an online e-commerce site, they remember you one time you would have visited two years ago, let alone you visit two hours ago today. <laughs> But you know, it remembers you. But if you walk into a dealership, you can't. so my point is, it could be from any. channel they come so these three consumer journey is the first theme and these three are the core consumer journeys that we always work towards solving right and then the second is dealer feedback from the business so we have three ways we get feedback from dealers and we literally pay attention to it we listen we act we deliver so first is we have dealer council we meet with dealer councils uh, dealer principals and general managers we have product council 
every dealer operational area, you know, sales, service, within and parts, accounting. So every dealer operational area and digital as well, we have a product council. Third, most innovative, I don't think any other DMS company has it. Give From it our us, product, us. your user, you will see live user sentiment. Every user has a voice. In the product, there is a button to give feedback. One click, they can say how are what are how are we doing? What what would what would they like to see more on Techion? And we have a very nice workflow engine to get that product feedback. We have a dashboard, and then it goes all the way to our product team, and they use that to prioritize our product enhancements and features. So that's kind of how we do. You're tracking sentiment real time across every single user. Interesting. How do you ingest that data? Like, what do you see on your end? Like, what's the what's the feedback loop there? What does it look like? Yeah, so the feedback loop is, you know, it's it's cool. Most of the time, it's really, really cool. We get, like, you know, recognition. There are, there are times, you know, we get some uncomfortable feedback, which is okay. Honestly, I feel, especially coming from our source, I tell my team, guys, this is a gift for us. Literally, take that feedback, let's go work on it. And we take, if there's 100 people who are complaining about, like, you know what, this feature in parts wholesale function is not working great, you guys suck at it. Then we take that and say, okay, I'll tell my product lead, what are you doing about it? So in my product reviews, I'll see, okay, there is a roadmap item, we are going to solve it. Honestly, some of those people literally turn around when we launch a feature the next month, solving that problem, we can see from the feedback also. They get thrilled, right? Like, Holy shit, when you guys really delivered, you listen to me. So, which is a you know, powerful, powerful thing when you listen to your customers and you deliver. Uh, so, yeah, we have a very clear workflow that goes through. We have a dashboard. Every team is tagged by which product, which module, what problem the customer is facing. And then I have in my product review to say, how are we mapping our product prioritization and then how we are delivering back to our customers. One of the early stories I loved was that you actually owned a dealership. You you purchased a dealership for Techion, right? Like a physical dealership, two of them. Um, you, you don't have them anymore, right? Uh, we are almost in the final stages of closing them down, I mean, selling them. So I love that, right? Like talk about eating your own dog food, like really being being there in the nitty gritty. Like why did you decide to do that? When did you do that? Get, tell us about that process. The way we I thought about this from the beginning, right? We are strong product technology minds. We wanted to solve a big industry problem. We want we don't we don't want to be kind of very you know naive or even arrogant that like we are tech guys and we know everything. So we needed to spend time, and I started spending time. And thanks to some of our dealers, and as uh, I mentioned to you, the first dealer, whom um, in the Bay Area, he literally gave an office in his dealership to us, saying that we love what you guys are doing your team can spend time. So we started talking to their staff, how they operate, right? We wanted to do a full paradigm shift. So we we studied a lot about dealership. I hired a lot, lot more people from the industry. So it's a great hybrid. So we have a phenomenal product people from the tech industry. I hired a lot of people from the industry, from the automotive, from the dealership industry into the company. So great hybrid. Now, I felt like, you know what? We are nobody to go tell a dealer how to run their business using our software if we don't know how to run a business. So I felt this is an opportunity for me and my team to learn about dealership operations. This was, you know, December 2019, okay, when we launched the first dealership pilot. When we launched the first dealership pilot, I came to know that dealership is, that particular rooftop is going up for sale by the owner and i felt wow okay this is an opportunity to you know buy that dealership and make it as a lab so that we can launch the latest and greatest first there are a few reasons first understand the dealership business deeply for me and my team second we don't have to go you know i felt it is you know too bad to disturb a customer all the time asking, hey, can we go look into this? Deeper? Yeah, you can only you can only get yeah, so much of your clients' time. Business. Well, they've been very gracious. Our partners have been super gracious to give us time. Still, so There's only so much time you can get. Only so much you can do, exactly. So this, I felt, is incredible for us, for my team to go on. For me, I can give specific targets. In fact, our zero contact concierge, you will see in the product video, which, I'm, which I'll send you, was born from that dealership out of need because we saw that and 
while it was very tough covid hit and we were like you know we didn't by the way we we did it uh, i think we maybe we may, we may have raised our series b or we didn't we didn't have a lot of money as well to be honest with you i had to put my personal money to buy the dealership land and what year was this what year was this this was in 2019 end just few months before the covid thing oh, happened right? and, the entire peak and, covid thing and what, what brands did you buy general motors and then hyundai okay well you probably made a nice little profit there <laughs> yes we did yes we did to be honest with you it worked out phenomenally you know one is profit yeah. but honestly exponentially worked out to create a phenomenal product Correct. my team had which full of, which of course like that's that's of course the goal right it was to create a goal. better exactly. product yeah and that is exponential value for the size of you know of who we are as a company and how far we are growing the value is immense my team would launch new products new features without any doubts to that to dealerships first and then once and we'll have you know people there and i have dedicated one person to do qa testing there in addition to the users in the dealership and we incentivize the dealership users to give feedback and then instantly the feedback would go into the product and then we'll do a ga launch to rest of our dealers uh, incredible value and and honestly when i first made the decision i still remember in a closed you know in a conference room i announced it to a few of my direct reports um i got you know mixed reactions all good intentions one of the executive who came from the automotive industry who was my direct report was shot he was j i know you are very smart man you're you're good i've been in this industry this could go horribly wrong please the better let us not because he said like running a dealership is not easy especially you know you know the whole flooring and everything there's so many things that could go wrong and the last thing he also said if dealers would may consider us a competition what would happen i said why would that be you know it's okay you know we are we are doing it for the right reasons to be honest with you it was the reverse in conversations with dealer groups i we, they loved it the moment you mention that you own two dealerships you could see in their eyes and some even called out saying that like oh okay i can talk to you because now you know my business so it was a very positive thing in fact uh, no one ever thought we are a competition and that worked out phenomenally well in every case and it was uh, not an easy decision i was a bit nervous after all the warning signals people gave me and then i still decided it's the right thing to do and go make the decision ended up yeah being- and i think a testament going back to you know you mentioned earlier like first principles thinking i just think it's a testament to that right like thinking about it hey i'm building a product that's meant to serve this business if i can't you know be there to really experience it i mean or it just that's the way to create the best possible product um i think i think it's a super smart move and i'd have to imagine that the reason the reason you've sold them or are in the process of selling the final one is because you know you're at a different scale and size now and this exactly. is just much less product is through and we don't need a lab anymore we have you know hundreds now thousand plus customers we get enough feedback more than enough via all all channels and honestly we didn't want to distract ourselves uh, you know running a dealership business. even though we didn't run it in day to day we retained the same operator who was running it before and now we felt like you know it's fine it's okay we did what we needed to do the core purpose is more than solved fine if someone else who's a professional who wants to run a dealership can run it it's funny because when you said that like product is proven with thousands of dealers i i thought about i thought about sort of car dealership guy and how when i started i was just sharing stuff from my personal experience and whereas today i have like hundreds of people sending me stuff sending me information on a daily basis from you know big and small and it's like very very similar in that sense right that like my experiences are you know 1% of the content today whereas they used to be 100% and the 99% of the content truly is from the industry from every other person that's operating day to day and so just much stronger as a business as a platform when you know you have just a bigger uh just a wide array of clients to work with that's right and it, it is you know you're right a uh, very similar uh it was heartwarming to be honest with you while our demo stations were overflowing at an ada we had tons of our existing customers stop by and rave about in fact they were ready to go and speak to potential customers big groups big groups you know bergstrom you know mr john tim bergstrom after three years you know still they stopped by to say hello you know Rohrman group Ryan Rohrman was there like you know 20 plus we have multiple dealer groups Autobahn 
they were there. I mean, our customers, it was so heartwarming for them to stop by and say nice things. Of course, this, there are certain times they'll ask for a feature and, you know, can, can we get this? But overwhelmingly positive feedback, right? You, you know this more than any your your customers and for you, your, your listeners and your followers, you know, giving you great feedback. It's always feels, okay, you know what? I'm doing the right thing. Maybe I need I, to double I mean, down. Yeah, I, I, this is the stuff that's, you know, so I, so I want to flip it to you because I, I have some thoughts in my mind, but what do you think it takes to create that kind of connection with your audience from your perspective? Why do you think people stopped by your NADA booth at the convention in Las Vegas the other day and 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 acted like that? What is it? Yeah, uh, you know, I would say the genuine reason is we truly, truly empathize with our customers and we listen and we act and they know that. And it's not like we... See, so actions, uh, you, see, you know this, act, act, actions prove a lot more than words. So we don't just say that, we show it a lot more in action. I feel that's it. That's the way to best way to build connections and that's exactly what we are doing. And, and they truly, genuinely recognize that and believe in that and believe in a very long-term partnership and a relationship with us. Trust is the most important. It takes time to build. You know, once you build, you need to just make sure that you continue to keep up your word and show it in action and, you know, continue to maintain that relationship for a very long time. Beautifully stated. I want to ask you a personal question. Yes. Does anything keep you up at night? Uh, yeah. I mean, the thing is not, not a lot after many, many years. I have a, I have a routine that keep up. Uh, key is more, uh, yes, what keeps me up is all about how are we going to scale gracefully? To put it simple, that one line keeps going back in my mind again and again. How are we going to scale gracefully? There is an incredible demand. I don't have any doubt in my mind uh, that we are going to be super successful. We are successful now, but it's going to be even more. But that shouldn't make us complacent. We have to be on our toes to make sure that we continue to work towards taking the right steps to scale. So it's all about scaling. How am I going to make sure that from 1,000 to you know 2,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 dealers, how am I going to scale the business very successfully? And I've been taking steps and you may have seen, you know, many things, right? Um, product announcements to our focus. I'll send you that video. You, I think definitely you'll have an idea and whatever information outside of what I'm sharing here. If there's anything you want to pick it up from there, feel free to. Hired some, you know, key executives in the last 12 months. I hired multiple senior executives. Just recent two ones are a CFO and a CRO. These are, you know, end of the day, it comes to people, process, and systems that will help scale a business. Um, so that's my focus. That's, if anything, I lose sleep over, that's it. It's about how do I, how am I going to scale the business gracefully? I think, I think many people are in your, in your stage would share similar sentiment um, and making sure you retain that customer experience and that personal touch, which, you know, has really gotten you here. Biggest areas of opportunity. What are we looking at when we look at the horizon, you know? next five years with Techion, where are those areas of opportunity? What, what's, or what are you, and, and what are you most excited about? Yeah. First is, uh, you know, quite excited about um, really transforming the automotive industry. When I say transforming, one thing I feel there's a, there's a few important things I want to state. I think you will, you will get it. When, when I explain, there are people who get it, obviously, there are people who get it once you explain and break it down there are small percentage percentage of people who don't understand yet is automotive is an ecosystem you need to make sure that you create a win-win ecosystem for you win lose is when someone else is going to take the business away okay you need to make sure that you deliver what consumers are looking for what modern consumers are looking for that doesn't mean you have to compromise the business, compromise the profit, compromise the efficiency. You can still do all of those and still making sure you deliver the best consumer experience. What do I mean by that? So first, from a dealership operations perspective, you need to make sure that you put the horse before, not the cart before the horse. Some people still do that. You know, making it, okay, you know, my team knows only how to do this this way. This is how they've done it and this is how it will be. Unfortunately, you're putting the, you know, cart before the horse. The horse is the consumer experience and consumer loyalty. If you lose that, you're done. Oh, any business, isn't it? 
So for me, my my customer is the dealer, but at the end of the day, for them, their their customer is the consumer. If you compromise consumer experience, consumer loyalty, retention, you can't be in business for too long. So we explained that. That's something we feel there is a massive opportunity. Automotive industry is evolving so much, transforming the retail technology platform. I feel strongly not too too far in the future. Techion will have like you know at least sixty percent of the automotive transactions going through our platform. I like um, it. Audacious. Selling, servicing, and engaging. Why sixty? So, Why is that the number? At least I said. Uh, at least six. <laughs> I think opportunity is so big, to be honest with you, because it's been underserved so much, and except for a few areas where people are innovating, majority are still doing lip service and not truly innovating or transforming. And I feel we are doing it. We are showing it in action. So the opportunity is huge. I'm not saying there are others who won't do it. We strongly encourage. You know, fair, good competition, which will keep us on our toes. So we truly encourage anyone who wants to do this complimentary and you know, could do this. We'll strongly encourage and work with them. So that's why we created a partner cloud. We continue to not only you know a- anyone who even competes with us is okay to go work on an API and integrate with Techion. Doesn't matter. There are many complimentary partners we work with. So now that that said, the opportunity is bringing the OEMs dealers and the industry ecosystem partners like you know insurance providers fni insurance you know rideshare providers there's so many who are providing to the ecosystem software providers bringing them together to create a win-win ecosystem i feel is the biggest opportunity in the past people in this space have been dividing and conquering what do, what do i mean by that kind of you know pitting each other oems and dealers and ecosystem partners against each other to be honest with you, as I said, win-lose is the complete opposite of win-win. So we believe in win-win without compromising your priorities. So as I said, there are some myths and rumors, you know, you'll see, I think it'd be great to break that and it keeps coming up. And when we break it, people understand it. Of course, I I, I, I wish I can, but I can't be in front of every, every single dealer or OEM. One of the rumors is, oh, you know, Techion, shares a lot more data with its OEM, absolutely not true. In fact, it's the opposite. We give it in writing to our dealers. They own their data. We license it and they have full control, full control. There are providers in this space who give it in writing saying that you don't own the data. Dealers, you don't own the data. We own the data. That's what they say. So we don't, we do the exact opposite. So dealers shouldn't have even the slightest doubt that they own, they are in control. In fact, we are in the process of providing a dashboard of all the data going in and out of their dealer ecosystem so that they have capability to turn on or turn off. Okay. So that's one. And unifying, what I mean by that is today people are unfortunately fighting on the wrong things versus focusing on the customer experience. Bringing the customer experience together, making sure you provide a seamless customer experience, you're going to not only gain more customers, you can retain more customers and continue to do more upsell and cross sell using technology. And people today, we all know this, believe technology a lot more than they believe people. It's unfortunate, but reality. Well, beautifully said, man. Dude, this has been um, fascinating. I learned a lot for sure. And um, just, man, the, the, the journey you're on, it's, it's really, really admirable. So, you know, I think you guys are, you're doing great things and it's uh, really, really cool to see from the side. So, you know, if you can leave us off with, you know, your vision for the company and, you know, for, for the future, I know off the record earlier on the conversation, you were mentioning to me that you are here to build something durable for the long term, right? An IPO may happen at some point. That's all kind of, you know, financial mechanisms to keep the company growing. But, but what is that? You know, give us that like big picture vision that you have. Yeah, thank you, Yossi, for asking. You know, it's a, it has been a f- fantastic, you know, engaging and discussing with you. Um, great discussion. Um, from a company perspective, as I mentioned to you before, truly from day one, you know, honestly, it's not, I'm not saying this for the interview. We can talk to any of my people who have been with the company for long enough. 
I've always mentioned we are we are in this as a long term journey, long term journey. We deliver long term value. We are in this for a very long term journey. We want to be. I don't know if it's a direct comparison. We want to be companies like you know Oracle and SAP from a durability perspective, Salesforce companies who have been there for decades, continue to deliver value, and we will be. We are already. You know, from a tech perspective, we have most advanced tech, even some of the tech companies, more advanced than some of the tech companies. And we are delivering value. And as I mentioned to you, there are times where people ask me, you know, what's your exit plan? And I said, I, I don't have one. There's really no exit plan because I'm not planning to exit this because this is an incredible opportunity. And then sometimes people ask, when is the IPO? Then people during an interview process, if a candidate asks that to me, and I clearly tell him, Hey, yes, it's a milestone. Sometime it will happen or it may not happen. But if you're joining for this, I said, please don't join. If this is the one reason you're joining, please don't join. It's okay. Because we are in this for very <laughs> long term. They get, they are a little bit short, but at the end of the day, that's the truth, right? If you are in joining for something short term, you're not going to build something valuable for long term. So I truly believe we are going to be here for many decades to come. Um, so yeah, very excited about the future. We are, you know, you know this well. We are just starting. I mean, you know, the ecosystem is so big. I mean, just the franchisee dealer network is 17,000. If you add independent and others, it's much larger than if you add global, it's even bigger. We are literally crossing 1,000. Think about the opportunity. We are excited. The demand is strong. Super excited about this company. We are going to be here, you know, looking forward to staying in touch and, you know, connecting back again whenever that happens. Love to hear it. Jay Vajayan, thanks for coming on the pod. We're going to put the link to Techion in the show notes below. So if anyone wants to learn more about Techion, they can click on the link in the show notes below. Jay, thanks for coming on. This was awesome. Enjoy the conversation, Yossi. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating. Consider subscribing to the show and check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.